Good afternoon. Welcome to the Mid Michigan Innovation Center. Many familiar faces. We're glad you all could make it up today. We've got a great uh, enlightening speaker series for you. A couple of things to note. First, we're going to be passing around a sign in sheet. Please do sign in. We need to keep records for our uh, funding partners, the MEDC, and a few other folks. So we like to know who comes to what. So we're going to pass that around. Only one person signed in, so I applaud whoever that was uh, for their effort. Second piece is in front of you, you should have this upcoming events. Please take note of these events and uh, try and participate in as many as possible. Of note, we've got Boost Gaylord, which is our two-minute pitch competition coming up on uh, February 26th, which is next week. Um, and then our next speaker series, the third Tuesday of March, is Lee Rouse, the President and CEO of Omnitech International. We'll be talking about strategic planning uh, for organizational effectiveness. And one that's not on here that you always need to take note of is Heading for the Big Leagues will be on May 30th this year at uh, the Dow Diamond. We're hoping to do it bigger and better just like every year. Uh, last year we had over 55 companies and over 350 people come. This year we'd like to uh, take it well beyond that. So you all should participate. It is this region's largest celebration of entrepreneurship and innovation. And you need to be part of it. Is there a date for that yet? May 30th. May 30th. Mark your calendars, tell your friends, and bring your family. Uh, so, our speaker for today is Terry O'Brien. She is an accomplished researcher, scientist, and all sorts of other accolades. A published author of multiple books, uh, active Blue Water Angels member, and a member of the Innovation Center, and an all around great person to know. So, without further ado, Terry O'Brien. <laughs>
that will perform in the existing uh, production plants or in existing customer's environment or their customer's way of doing things is really the most powerful way to get a product into the marketplace fast <coughs> and get marketplace acceptance. Uh, and it can be something as trivial as you're still pumping liquids, okay? Don't bring in a powder into my plant. I know how to pump liquids. I don't know how to pump powders. All right, now there's lots of people out there that pump powders every day and they move them around and don't have any problems, but I'm not that person, so I have to now go learn how to do that. I have to uh, train people on it. I have the risk of not getting it right. I have to put in new equipment. I have to put in new uh, storage capacity for all this. Something that seems very minor at the lab level can be hugely different in terms of how people use it. So one of the things I learned is everybody wants it to be the same. So if you can make your stuff be the same, but a little bit different and perform better while still working in the same equipment, um, with the same run rate, <coughs> with the same look and feel of what you're substituting for, then people are more receptive. Now, obviously, that's not always possible, but the more we think about it as scientists and researchers at the beginning, to say, how can we make it the least amount of hassle and the least amount of activation energy barrier to getting people to do it? the faster the products get accepted in the marketplace because there's more receptivity just to even look at the material. And, uh, and it's both in terms of our customers and if we have our own production facilities, our own engineers also appreciate the fact that we're using materials that closely align to the things that they're already familiar with. And as an example of this, when I was uh, creating a product, we had to add an extra pumping tank to pump liquids, and we were already pumping liquids. But the whole concept of having to put something in extra, figuring out if there was floor space to put it in, finding out the capital to do it, was a big deal. And so before we ever, early on, we knew we were going to have to do this, so we demonstrated we had to do it and, and drove it from the very beginning and got buy-in from the engineers that this was the only way to, to be successful. But usually when, my experience is when a researcher goes to a production plant, it's like all of the engineers are standing at the door saying, oh my gosh, here comes another wild idea. You just won't believe this, okay? So, um, you know, it's like they don't trust that we've thought about the production facility or anybody else other than the research lab. So it really does make an a difference. This next one here is staying focused on the vital few things that are going to drive the success of your project. In any project, when you first get started, it's almost always known at the beginning where the real tricky points are, the barriers to success, the things that are going to catch you, the gotchas, whatever you want to call them, the critical success factors. But oftentimes we try to ignore them or hope they'll go away. And my experience is they don't go away. They just get worked on later, so therefore the options of fixing them are fewer and they're more costly because you're trying to do it very quickly. So my experience has always been to get them out front and work on those first because if you can't fix those, it doesn't matter about the rest. The project's not going to be successful. And sometimes in research, it's a real trap because you don't always get the day-to-day -day pressure of the customer calling. They don't even know that the product may be being developed. And so it kind of feels like there's no immediate pressure. We've got time to work on things. But actually, in the real world, um, with the business environment, uh, time is money. And so there is no luxury of taking a longer period of time. And actually, it's more like the picture on the right where there's always a hole in the boat and we're trying to bail out as fast as we can to stay afloat. And so for me, I've always had a very strong time consciousness about any project. And by focusing in on the most critical success factors and working on, I've either been able to work on terminating projects or pushing them forward. And we had some cases, you know, I've had a case where were four critical success factors. And in a year working on it, we were able to solve three of them, but not the fourth. So the product was, the technology was sold because we couldn't make it work. But we did get some money for it, and far more money, because we were able to prove the other parts of the technology so that somebody else that could use it uh, had a better shot of, of having a success. Can you give me an example of what uh, like a critical success factor might be? 
Sure. So, okay, let's say we're making um, any kind of a, a, a widget, right? We're making some kind of a widget, and for it to work in the customer's plan, they use it farther down in the process, they use a degreasing software agent, right? So they're cleaning it up and they use a degreasing agent. If we cannot get our stuff to either be enclosed enough to not touch the degreasing agent or to be acceptable in contact with that degreasing agent, we're out, right? So we might just as well figure out which of those two is going to work. If we can't figure out either solution, we'd have to come up with a different solution from the beginning or we can stop working. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, and sometimes we get in the trap that because I've seen this for myself also, where if something is easy to do, so you keep pushing farther and farther on exploring that, but actually you're way past what you're required to do. So just stop and, and work on the critical issues and don't keep working on the easier things. And this one is a real trap for scientists, and that is letting the valleys of depression get us down. As a scientist, it seems like there is always another problem coming down the pike. Uh, that's just the nature of research. You know, I've always said that if research worked right the first time, it would be called search, not research. There's a reason why it's called research. And as a scientist, sometimes these nuts that you have to crack are very tough and challenging, just like in any other function. And people would sometimes get caught in this mire. It's like each time there was a, a new problem that was identified, it was like they were down in a hole that they couldn't get out of. But really, if the perspective has changed and you see problems that you identify as progress forward, then you can go faster. And so what I looked at it was that any identification of a problem was half the solution. If you couldn't see the problem, you couldn't solve it. So I've always worked on uh, celebrating the fact that I have identified a problem because then I have a chance to fix it. And one of the hardest things to do sometimes as a researcher is to actually get feedback on your product. It's your baby. It's hard to have somebody say, this is awful and terrible and doesn't work what we think. It has no hope. So as a researcher, we continue to work and struggle to try to make it into something that we've always thought was Perfect. But really, it's never hard. Rarely is it ever right the first time the customer sees it. And part of it is because the customer can't always tell us at the beginning what they need. They tell us from the perspective of what they know, but once they've seen the product, they've touched the product, they've used it, they've applied it to their situation, either they now know something they didn't know before. So they can tell us about that, or there may be some things, well, well, everybody knows that. Well, guess what? We didn't know, okay? So what I have found is getting a prototype out as fast as possible and working with friendly customers, people that are willing to understand that this isn't the perfect end-all product, but it is a work in progress, is the fastest, one of the fastest ways of getting uh, a product into the marketplace. Because there's always something wrong, but if you don't get the communication and the dialogue going, you don't know what it is. And the longer you take to get to that point, the more you have built into the product perhaps other parameters that you have to unbuild. So getting it out there earlier is really important. And it's a way to get feedback that you are on the right track with the customer. Plus, sometimes projects change. People get new requirements. You know, the first day you sit down and talk with them, they have the information they have, but in the course of you asking questions, it has triggered other questions in their mind. So they go talking to their customers and get additional information and may or may not pass it on to you, right? But then when you have these follow-up discussions, that's when the, when the extra information comes out. So always getting a prototype out there early um, is it, really powerful. I can remember one time, you know, when I was working at Dow, uh, in the Dow, it's a very large company, so there's a lot of vertical integration. Sometimes their customer lives inside the fence line. And I had this idea, and I thought this was just wonderful. So try it on over and talk to the manufacturing guys about this. And this was like 10 minutes up here, and this is the dumbest idea I've ever heard in various combinations of words. And then, you know, and then I said, well, okay, so what do you need? Right? You don't need that. I got that point. 
So then they told me what they needed, and so we were able to work on it and solve that problem. So it didn't matter that I came up with the dumbest idea to start with. All it mattered was that I was willing to work with them on whatever they needed and break the open communication. So, you know, these things can work. And the other part about this as a researcher is it's not just the performance of the final product in the customer's hands. It's also can be how things are manufactured, how they're shipped. Uh, many products are shipped at ambient conditions because it's so much cheaper. But that can be from minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit to plus 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So how do you ship your product? How do you contain it? How, what are the implications for it sitting on a rail car in Arizona in the middle of the summer? Or sitting in Minnesota on a rail car in the middle of the winter? You know, are parts going to crack? Are they, I, you know, it's, are they packed well enough? All these things can have an implication. So as a researcher, you need to think about those things of how much tension you can build into a part or have to take out of a part. It's not just on how things are shipped or used, and it's also in how things are made. So I mentioned earlier about a degreasing material, okay? It's not just where the part is made. It can be used in another subassembly, which can be used in another part. And all of those manufacturing processes have different requirements. So somewhere in that, that part might, even though it never gets painted, might have to withstand a paint oven because it's part of an assembly that is getting painted. So it's understanding the whole concept of how the part is being used. And it's only when you get out there and start really working with customers that sometimes these things should come out. <coughs> and you can spend a lot of time as a researcher developing new products and then miss the evaluation window of what the customer has established and you're out. So what is the, by this I mean, typically when there's a need, companies will start looking for a new product. You want to be able to get your product into that evaluation cycle, and sometimes you just need a small sample to get started, but then they may need a bigger quantity, and if you're a new small company and can't supply it, you're going to miss that window. Or if they want to run a production trial, can you make enough material to do this? And a lot of times in manufacturing, things are made on a cyclical basis. Certain times of the year, a product is used, and so uh, companies do not design plants to run at peak uh, sales capacity around because it's too cost and efficient. So what they do is they inventory stuff going up to the maximum use time. And during those times where they're running a plant flat out, you cannot get in to run a production trial. So if you miss the window for when they're, they're at the slow times in their plant to get your product in, you may either miss that whole cycle and have to wait a year, or you may be out because somebody else's product got in. And once a product is decided on, it could be five, ten years before they go back and redo that situation. So really understanding as a researcher what your customer's evaluation cycle is is critical. Because you might be better off getting an almost perfect product in there on time versus a better than perfect product that will wait. Because you can be out for years, decades. Once a company decides on something, it's so time consuming uh, and costly that companies typically don't go back the next year and redo it again unless there's a crisis in the performance. They'll go on to the next project. I've always tried to do on any product I'm developing is to evolve production from the start. Engineers really have a tough challenge if you give them a finished product and log it over the wall and then ask them to make it. They have all sorts of opportunities for it to not to work. And you know, almost always my experience is you go back <coughs> months and months of time if, uh, to fix those problems or address those issues that manufacturing might have versus if you start right from the beginning and get their input and design the product around their issues or understand what their issues are and do the experiments that are needed to actually effectively handle those uh, questions. Sometimes there's scale factors and you just, if it's not perfect knowledge, you know, when you go from a thousand gallon reactor to a, uh, from a one gallon reactor to a 10,000 gallon reactor, there's scale issues in there, how fast the 
<laughs> where the shear rates are, how you transfer heat, all these kinds of things. And so it's not perfectly understood. There are approximations, uh, but clearly each product has its own issues. But there are things that engineers do get concerned about, and understanding the rates at which you can move things around, put things into kettles, move them out of reactors, uh, process them, all makes a difference in how you design your experiments, and it doesn't cost anything if you build it in at the beginning, and it doesn't delay the time. But if you don't do it at the beginning, my experience is that um, you wind up doing it at the end at a more expensive time frame, and it extends the amount of time it takes to get its product to market. Okay, so those are my keys. Maybe I can qualify this for a second. I just finished this really neat book about a Buddhist monk and a quantum physicist. And they talk about how they're really described the same reality. We're not Buddhist monks or quantum physicists, but there's such a parallel between what you're describing as the challenge of the research scientist and that of the entrepreneur. I took each of your points and you could almost say, that's a lesson for the research scientist. It's the same lesson for the entrepreneur. So you, your work has worked in both communities now. Do you want to just comment on Are they the same? How are they different? Um, yes, I apply all. Uh, okay, so let's just go through them. So as an entrepreneur, I'm always asking, what does already get known? What's already known? I don't waste my time trying to reinvent the wheel. You don't get a patent on it the second time around. So, you know, it's always what, who knows what. Well, who is the supplier that might be able to help me? Who's the customer that might be able to help me? What's out there that's already known in patents? Whatever I'm trying to do. Minimizing changes. Uh, my philosophy is always you go to where somebody is and then bring them to where I am. So I always try to understand where the customer is, where their thought process is, what they're trying to work on. And then see how whatever I have to offer them makes sense to them. Staying focused on the vital few, I always try to find the critical issues that are going to be important for success. Whatever the project is, or however success is defined, and I spend the time and effort making those things happen. Yeah. What does that graphic mean where you got the big ship with an X? That's the life of luxury, you know, like you have the luxury of all the time in the world. On the point there, avoid the illusion of progress. Uh, when you were covering that, I thought to myself, are you meaning, you mean that you don't want to let people know that you're right on schedule, or do you want to let them know that uh, you're falling behind, or? Oh, no, that's a good question. Yeah, no, what I'm talking about, I, I think you need to be honest with people on where you are at all times, you know, if they ask you tell them, right? But uh, what I'm talking about here is that sometimes people can get into the trap as researchers that we think we're making progress because we're doing stuff, we're being active, we're making activity happen, but we're not focusing in on the most critical things. So the critical things are just not getting done to fall behind. But because we can do, can do something, we can choose to keep doing more and more of that. But we don't work on the critical things. And so for me, it's always been, as, as an entrepreneur, what, what are the most important things? You know, I look at it as like the dashboard on a car. What are those things that I need to stay focused on? Uh, don't let the valleys get you down. I think all problems are an opportunity for a solution. So um, I try to keep a very positive attitude about things. Um, problems are fine. I don't care. I'll, I'll go work on them because I believe there's an answer somewhere. I just have to go find it. Yes. How do you sort through, uh, in, when you're doing research, how do you sort through all the bad information out there? <laughs> Oh, you mean like on the internet? <laughs> well, you know, some of it you have to double check. Some of it you have to talk to other people. So that's what I do. I'll talk to other people. Does this make any sense to you? Uh, sometimes I've been led down a path and then it's clear that it's not working. So I'll say, okay, that was a bad piece of information. You can, from a scientific standpoint, you can look at citations. You know, so technology that has applicability usually has citations. So there's some value behind it. 
I just try to triangulate on the most information, I guess. You know, just always take one piece of information. Yes. I mean, there's, there's so much information available now because of the internet. But at what point do you say, I've done enough, look around for information, and it's time to go and take off the direction we can take off? Well, you're right, so you can't keep can't keep looking. So at some point, I mean, I guess I just look at it and say, okay, do, does this make sense to me enough that I can have a path forward? Once I've created a path forward, I'm ready to go. You know, I can keep reading, but once I have a path, yes. yes. What's the difference between research and invention? To me, research is a process. Invention is a, an outcome. Result. I'd like to research. Oh, yeah, that's really good. Thanks. Do you have any advice for inventors out there that uh, believe that once they invent something that happens, then someone will just come and buy it from them out of the blue? You mean they don't? <laughs> that's really for me salesmanship in action, I have to say that. Um, I put it on the map. You know, I think a patent gives you an entree into people's uh, receptivity to looking at your stuff. But really, it's only the start. It's only the start. You have to look at the patent and say, how much utility does the patent have? Um, you know, you can get a patent that just very narrowly focuses and snakes its way through something. So it's almost like one of these little puffs on the, or tufts on the, um, Carpet, right? And you can do that. You can snake your way through, right? But then how much utility is there? Because maybe there's something else that you have to have acquired a right to in order to be able to use it. So you have to look at how important is this to somebody? How much value is it to them of what you have done? And then I think you have to package it around the whole picture. You know, like I said before, we had this one case where we had four critical issues and we could solve three. We couldn't solve the fourth one. But because we worked on it, we had enough information, we could get some patents around it, that together in aggregate told a much more powerful story than any three of those pieces separately. But did it, did it just, uh, could you just put it up on the internet on Craigslist and get something for it? No. You know, it took some real selling. It took creating the picture of what it was good for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we might be mistaking saying that invention is a patent. There's a difference between an invention and a patent. You can invent something, a way of solving a problem really is an invention. It may or may not have anything to do with a patent. A patent is, in today's world, uh, very specifically dictated by legal and all that kind of stuff and the patent process itself. And uh, Today, I think less than 40% of things you submit to be patented are patented. And it becomes, and also because on an international scale, if, if you have something that's uh, you know, of interest in China, for instance, uh, that complicates things immensely. But an invention is just a way of, of doing something that may or may not be unique, but solving a problem. Really. Absolutely. But That's a great point. It's not always a patent. I think that, I think Thomas Edison had a hard research. Um, it was a concept that he went home with research. And I think that invention is something that concept from the part of the equation. Right. And then your research pull that off. But the inventor is the one that comes up with a concept that has not been thought of before. Um, but it's really a solution to a problem. And he, he decides that you know, we need to make the light out of some other way than the candle. And uh, so he's a concept guy. But all the researchers who work on that, that is that they were all and, and probably so because because you come up with the concept. Uh, it, it really is an innovation, something that someone's willing to pay for. Just an invention, something new isn't necessarily a value. <coughs> and pat patents are wonderful, I love them, but they don't always create value. In fact, they often destroy it. <coughs> you have to be very wise and careful about what you decide to patent. Well, you patent. And like you said, your little narrow patent, you may actually destroy more value than you create by teaching people how to get little ways around what you're doing. 
Oh, absolutely. So, uh, and I can give you. You'd be better off to not have mm -hmm. one off. It's very, you have to be very careful what you have. Right. There was one competitive product out there that we were trying to uh, figure out an alternative to. And um, somebody said, oh, it'll take you 10 years to figure this out. Well, I found a patent out there where, and in the patents, you know, they have to teach what's known to those uh, skilled in the art. So I found a patent that basically said, you know, this is approximately where you have to go. Saved roughly seven or eight years worth of time because all I now needed to do was to go do that and then I could go from there to the, the twists and turns that I needed to do from that standpoint, right? But I knew nothing about it when I started, right? And so you're right, absolutely. I mean, I'm standing here as one of the groups that you can teach your competitors quite nicely. Did you use the truths tool to get there? Uh, not for that project. This was before this. <laughs> to get defended or have to defend the bank. I, I really question the value of the reform. Because you talk to your attorney, he says, well, it can cost you anywhere from 5000 to $10 million to defend that bank. And uh, you might have seen it less than 100000 to defend it, whether you win or lose. It's expensive. Very expensive. Uh, that's been my experience. Unless you can have a target customer that's willing to pay for the patent, do the development work up front, so you're partnered with them right from the beginning of the concept, and they're large enough to defend it internationally if it's something that has real value, you're wasting your time and money. And you'll put, you'll put it in the public. Okay. Yeah, and then it becomes public domain. You know, I think that, that the processes that are unique to you are probably more valuable than the patent. Scientists and entrepreneurs, we're, we're doing the same thing. And they, who is the better support infrastructure today? Are you, if us user scientists that Dow is doing the same thing an entrepreneur is doing over here, who is the better infrastructure? You know, when you go back to that slide of the depressions when things fall apart, Dow has a you know, you're you're part of a bigger support infrastructure. Are we getting better research science entrepreneurship out of big corporations today than new startups? I think you get, yeah, I think you get, yeah, I think you get, I think you get, I think you get different course things. I think uh, entrepreneurs have a quickness, uh, a willingness to listen, uh, and they're closer to the customer, so they have that closer, they can get an integrated knowledge and apply, right? You don't have filters of going through seven different people, uh, which happens in a large company, because somebody at the bench doing research may not ever see a customer about that project. They're relying on somebody in tech support or, or uh, development or somebody that's a salesperson who may not understand the technology to communicate. So, you know, it's kind of like playing telephone as a gift in some respect. So, in a large corporation, you get to bring the power of multiple expertise together that an entrepreneur may not have, right? So, so I think there's strengths in both groups. But I think both groups are finding that they have to go faster. If you could take anything from Dow Corning or Dow and make it available for a startup, what, what is it? What would be your top priority? Oh gosh, I don't know. That would be a challenge. It depends, I think, on the company. But in general, it's their access to I think the library systems that they've built, the, the knowledge bases, the tech, it's just the access to information. Because you can do so much now. Uh, you can contract manufacturers. Now. There's hundreds of contract manufacturers out there anymore. So that part of it I don't think is as strong of an advantage for the large companies as it used to be. Uh, but their ability to aggregate information, <coughs> pay for aggregated information, mine their discard pile. <laughs> Sometimes it's good technology to fit the core competencies and there's some there's some gems in the world as well. Anything else? Questions? 
Thank you very much.